Hello and welcome to our first lecture in this series on physiological psychology. Today we're going to be talking about the basic building blocks of the nervous system, which are neurons and glial cells. Having a baseline information in this area is particularly important as we start talking about different neuron types, neurotransmitters, and how neurons work. So quick overview, these are the cells of the nervous system. So all of your mental experiences depend on the activity of a huge number of separate but interconnected cells. And by huge numbers, we're talking billions and billions. We can begin to understand how this works by looking at those cells of the nervous system. So these individual cells, in their combined efforts, make up all of our abilities to walk, talk, see, hear, chew gum, the dream about the future, remember the past, all of that is occurring through the action of these little cells. So the nervous system comprises two kinds of these cells, neurons and glia. And the neurons are the functional parts of the nervous system, whereas the glial cells are the support structure. In fact, glia means glue in ancient Greek or Latin or something. And so they are the sort of glue that holds the nervous system together. They provide nourishment. They deal with waste products, they help support structures, they provide myelin sheaths, so they're particularly important as well. The glial cells are also unfortunately uh, rapidly dividing, and so this is an area where we can often get uh, cancer. In fact, most brain cancers are caused by glioblastomas, so they're actually cancers of the glial cells. So the human brain contains approximately 100 billion individual neurons. This doesn't include neurons in the peripheral nervous system. So Vast, number, vast numbers of neurons and glial cells are responsible for everything we are and do. So, you know, in these cerebral cortex and association areas, there's about 12 to 15 billion neurons. In the cerebellum, about 70 billion neurons. And in the spinal cord, another billion or so neurons. So, billions and billions is not uh, an underestimation. So today we're going to talk about the structure of animal cells, because that's important for understanding the structures of a neuron, which will be our second topic. We'll talk then about different types of glial cells. We'll talk about the blood-brain barrier, and then finally finish up with nourishment of vertebrate neurons, which is important, of course, for keeping those cells alive. So the structures of animal cells, like other cells in the body, neurons contain all of the following structures. And you should have learned about this in previous biology courses. So the cell membrane, which is the outer covering of the cell. The nucleus, which is, of course, uh, contains the cell's DNA and is usually the powerhouse for the cell. Mitochondria, which are part of that powerhouse structure. Ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, and so on. So this is the basic electron micrograph of the parts of a neuron. You can see the cell nucleus, the plasma membrane, which is really important, the mitochondria, which are part of our aerobic energy metabolism structures. Uh, and then the endoplasmic reticulum, which are responsible for um, production of proteins and other substances. So the cell membrane separates the inside of the cell from the outside environment. Uh, this is particularly important for neurons, and we'll talk about this here in a moment, because the semi-permeable nature of the neuronal membrane allows it to generate an electrical potential, which is how all of our, our brain functioning works, is by generation of electrical signals. The nucleus of the cell, of course, contains its DNA and its chromosome. The mitochondrion performs metabolic activities and provides energy that these cells require. The ribosomes are sites at which the cell synthesizes new protein molecules. And the endoplasmic reticulum are networks of thin tubes that transports newly synthesized proteins to the location. So this is going to be particularly important in understanding how neurons uh, in your nervous system generate and create neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are proteins that are responsible for neuronal communication, responsible for things like uh, regulating our mood, regulating reinforcement, reward properties, uh, euphoria, that's how drugs work. So we'll talk quite a bit about neurotransmitters in future lectures. For now, we're going to talk about the structures of a neuron itself. Neuron cells are similar to other cells of the body, but do have distinctive shapes. In fact, the shape and structure of neurons uh, depends primarily on their location and their function. What you see in front of you right now is a pyramidal cell. It's called that because it has that kind of pyramid shape. Uh, this is a cell that is, can typically be found in the hippocampus, which is an important part of the brain for memory fo formation. So those pyramidal cells of the hippocampus 
uh, have some really important functions we'll talk about in later lectures. To give you a sense of what some of these neurons are doing, we have, of course, motor, neuro motor neurons, <laughs> motor neurons and sensory neurons. Motor neurons have uh, their soma, or cell body, in the spinal cord. They receive excitation from other neurons, and they conduct impulses along its axon uh, to a muscle. These motor neurons can be from millimeters long to meters long. So, for example, the probably longest motor neuron you have is the one that you might use to wiggle your big toe. That motor neuron travels from the lumbar region uh, or sacral region of your um, spinal cord all the way down uh, to your toe. So that is a single neuron that travels that entire distance. Sensory neurons then are specialized at one end to be highly sensitive to a particular type of stimulation. So we'll talk about these in more detail later. This is where signal transduction occurs. That is, energy in the environment is converted into neural signals. So this would be a vertebrate mo motor neuron where we have uh, dendrites receiving information uh, telling us to fire a muscle fiber that then travels down the axon to the muscle itself, causing the muscle to either contract or relax, depending on uh, what direction the motor signal is occurring. A vertebrate sensory neuron, of course, the information is going the other direction from the skin surface uh, up to uh, the spinal cord and then synapsing on uh, up to the brain. So some components of all neurons include dendrites, the soma or salvani, axons, and uh, what we call presynaptic terminals, which are also part of the axon itself. So we're going to take each of these individual components and talk about them in some at least limited detail. So dendrites are the receiving end of a neuron. These are branching fibers with a surface lined with synaptic receptors that are responsible for bringing information into a neuron. Some also contain dendritic spines that further branch out and increase the surface area of the dendrite. This provides that neuron with more surface area with which to capture neurotransmitters and therefore makes it more sensitive. That is, it's more likely to generate what we call an action potential or uh, an electrical signal. And so these dendritic spines increase the um, information processing capability of that postsynaptic neuron. So the greater the surface area of a dendrite, the more information it can actually receive. So uh, these dendritic spines form really important functions in terms of increasing the sensitivity of uh, postsynaptic cells. So this is what these dendritic spines look like. They add a great deal of surface area to uh, the surface of a dendrite and allow for a lot more neurotransmitter interaction uh, with the cell. The cell body, or soma, uh, contains the nucleus, mitochondria, and ribosome. So the cell body is the powerhouse contains the, the cell nucleus. This is where instructions for creating neurotransmitters occur. So this is responsible for all the metabolic work of a neuron. Uh, it's also covered with synapses on its surface in many different kinds of neurons. Uh, in fact, also in some limited instances can release neurotransmitters um, to signal the presynaptic cell to stop releasing neurotransmitters. So the cell body is particularly important. Again, this is generally where most neurotransmitters are synthesized. They then travel the axon uh, and then are bundled in what are called vesicles. Those vesicles travel the length of the axon until they reach the uh, synaptic terminals or what's often what are often called terminal buttons and then are released into the synapse to then interact with the next neuron and cause uh, changes in excitation there. The axon then is the thin fiber of a neuron responsible for transmitting nervous impulses toward other neurons, organs, or muscles. Most um, neurons contain a single axon, but many dendrites. Axons may have a myelin sheath, which is an insulating material that contains interruptions in the sheath known as the nodes of Ranvier. Now this is particularly important for what's called saltatory conduction. And what happens in saltatory conduction is nervous impulses are sped up. They travel much faster because they don't have to travel as far. So rather than traveling the full length of the axon, the electrical signal jumps from one node of Renvier to the next, uh, allowing for very rapid communication. Unfortunately, that myelin sheath, uh, which creates what we call white matter, can uh, degrade due to certain diseases such as multiple sclerosis. And multiple sclerosis, for some reason, the immune system 
attacks the myelin sheath, and as a result, you end up with some losses of sensory and motor functioning. At the end of the axon are presynaptic terminals. These are the endpoints of an axon which release chemicals to communicate with other neurons. So this is the point at which uh, vesicles will bind with the cell membrane and release neurotransmitter into the synapse when an action potential reaches these presynaptic terminals. So what happens is an electrical signal is generated by the cell. It reaches the end uh, of the axon at this presynaptic terminal that then causes the release of these chemicals into the synapse. Those chemicals then interact with the next neuron, which creates a signal, and that goes on to the next neuron, and so forth. Quick note about some terminology. Afferent axons refer to those bringing information into a structure. So um, an afferent neuron would be a motor neuron. Efferent neurons refers to carrying information away from a structure. Uh, interneurons or intrinsic neurons are those whose dendrites and axons are completely contained within a single structure. Interneurons are particularly important uh, in the cerebral cortex, obviously, uh, but also in the spinal cord because what happens uh, is the spinal cord can generate what's called a reflex arc. So if you touch something hot, that sensory signal will travel to the spinal cord, short circuit through an inner neuron, and then cause a motor, con motor uh, signal to cause you to constrict or move your hand away from something that's causing damage. So efferent is moving away from a structure, afferent is moving towards a structure. There are variations amongst different neurons. They vary in size, shape, and function. The shape of a neuron determines its connection with other neurons and its contribution to the nervous system. This function is closely related to the shape of the neuron. So shapes of neurons really have a lot to do with how they function. So for example, uh, Purkinje cells of the cerebellum are extreme uh, branch. They have these extreme branches in their dendrites, but that's all within a single plane, so they're kind of two-dimensional. Uh, so the cerebellum is actually these sort of stacks of these Purkinje cells, which is why there are so many billions of, of cells packed within this really pretty small part of the brain. So this is what those look like. You can see in the upper left hand corner here number or letter A. This is a Purkinje cell with these massive branches out in a single plane. Uh, this would be a bipolar uh, pyramidal cell. This would also be a bipolar cell um, with the cell body here in the middle. Um, <coughs> so there are all sorts of different kinds of um, neurons that we'll talk about as having various functions. Next thing to talk about are glial cells. There are different types of glial cells that have different functions. Astrocytes help synchronize the activity of an axon by wrapping around the presynaptic terminal and taking up chemicals released uh, by the axon so they can actually regulate the firing of neurons. Microglia are really important. These are sort of the janitors of the brain system. They remove waste material, viruses, and fungi from the brain. So this is how our brain is able to heal itself. So very important functions of the microglia. Um, so if we get a buildup of toxins in the brain, the microglia have to work hard to get those out. Uh, and so these are particularly important if there's something happening um, in your brain. The oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells are responsible for the creation of the myelin sheath that surrounds and insulates certain vertebrate neurons. Oligodendrocytes are only in the brain and spinal cord, and Schwann cells are only in the periphery of the body. So anything outside of the brain or spinal cord, the myelin sheath is created by a Schwann cell, whereas in the brain and spinal cord, uh, this is created by the oligodendrocytes. Radioglia are only important during development. This guides the migration of neurons and the growth of their axons and dendrites during embryonic development. And then once you have finished developing, the radioglia assume other functions. So this is a quick look. You can see uh, the astrocytes interact with capillaries um, and uh, other cells, the Schwann cells. Each single Schwann cell is a single segment of the myelin sheath, whereas an oligo oligodendrocyte uh, might have several projections out to cover several neurons at several segments. And then the microglia are here uh, helping to uh, clean up uh, the nervous system. This leads us to talking then about the blood-brain barrier. This is an important mechanism that surrounds the brain and blocks most chemicals from entering the brain. Uh, the immune system destroys damaged or infected cells throughout the body, and then they're usually replaced. But because neurons in the brain generally do not regenerate, it's vitally important for the blood-brain barrier to block incoming viruses, bacteria, 
or other, other harmful material from entering because if the immune system starts attacking those cells, we can't really replace them. We do generate new neurons, but not at the rate that we do, say, skin cells or blood cells or other things. So how the blood-brain barrier works, uh, primarily it's a um, solid, almost completely solid wall that only allows a few things to passively diffuse, including oxygen and carbon dioxide, and unfortunately carbon monoxide. Um, most everything else is brought across through what's called active transport. This is a protein-mediated process that expends energy to pump chemicals from the blood into the brain. So glucose, certain hormones, amino acids, and a few vitamins are brought into the brain via active transport. So this is actually an active transport process that occurs. The blood-brain barrier is essential to our health, but it poses a serious difficulty if we're trying to treat the brain. So if we're trying to treat cancer, it's difficult to get chemotherapy past the blood-brain barrier. So it's one of the reasons why brain tumors are often uh, treated with something called like the gamma knife, which is a radiation therapy treatment where they can target a brain tumor with um, several different gamma rays and try to destroy the tumor that way. Uh, chemotherapy is difficult to get past the blood-brain barrier. So our final note in this lecture is about nourishment of vertebrate neurons. So vertebrate neurons depend almost entirely on glucose. Uh, it's a sugar that's one of the few nutrients that can pass through the blood-brain barrier. Uh, our neurons also need a steady supply of oxygen. About 20% of all oxygen that we consume uh, is used by the brain. This is why hypoxia, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, carbon dioxide poisoning, all of these are particularly noxious because uh, the brain is then deprived of oxygen and uh, neurons then can die off. One important thing is the body needs thymine to use glucose, particularly the brain does. So prolonged thymine deficiency actually leads to the death of neurons. This is seen in Korsakoff syndrome, which is a result of chronic alcoholism. And what happens is um, people with Korsakoff syndrome no longer um, produce thymine because of the damage to their liver. So this is secondary to liver damage. And as a result, their neurons, particularly the pyramidal cells of the hippocampus and the mammillary glands, um, die off and you end up with this severe memory impairment as a, as a result of that loss. So thiamine and glu glucose are particularly important uh, for those functions. So to summarize, we have neurons and glial cells. These are the important cells in the nervous system. We'll talk much more about how they function and work together uh, in the coming lectures.